let's talk about the GLP-1 medications yeah. because they are transformative. Yes. And I think there's a lot of questions out there about what they are, how they work. So let's just start there. How do they work? So GLP-1 receptor agonist medications, they mimic natural hormones in the body. Now they are analogs, so they are synthetic hormones. So they mimic, they are not the same as. And what makes them so powerful is that they have a very long half-life. They last a very long time in the body, much longer than the natural native versions in our body. So GLP-1 is the most famous, and we see that in Ozempic and Wegovy. And then the next most famous is GIP, receptor agonist medication. We see that in combination with GLP-1, and that is trizepatide, Manjaro, or Zepbound. And how do they work? So they work on all over the body. Actually, I think this is thing, something that people don't realize that there are GLP-1 receptors all over the body. The biggest way that makes them the most effective is not actually the stomach, which everyone talks about. It does work on the stomach and it does decrease stomach emptying time and, and make you feel fuller. It's actually the brain. Mm -hmm. And that's where we see the biggest impact of this drug is that it, it directly influences the way that the brain is feeling, the way that it's experiencing hunger and fullness and thinking about food and thinking about sex and thinking about shopping. It, it has a very big impact. In, in terms of its primary FDA approved indications, it does work on the brain, the stomach, and then it's very effective on working on the level of the pancreas. So it really helps with any insulin resistance we see, but also what it does is it may fine tunes your body's insulin response to carbohydrates and blood sugar. And it just becomes very effective at sweeping up that blood sugar and, and, and processing it effectively rather than storing it as fat. And those three things are the biggest way that we see its effect in terms of weight loss and blood sugar regulation. I mean, I think they're, they're phenomenal. There's been a lot of talk on how they reduce uh, cardiovascular disease risk, renal failure. Very yes. recently, I saw some papers on that. In fact, I'll share some data here. Reduces the risk of renal failure by 16%, cardiovascular death, MI, or stroke by 13%, and all cause death by 12%. Yes. That is insane. I mean, these medications are extremely powerful. So you talked about how they affect the brain. So how does it, I, and what I've been told from like a friend of mine who started taking it, she said, you know what? The brain chatter is gone. Like all this thought about what I'm going to eat now, what I'm going to do next, what I'm going to have for dinner, like it's just not there anymore. Yep. Yeah. They call it food noise. Yeah. And that's like a, that is a, a term coined by the users. It's like, I don't have any more food noise. I yeah. don't think about it. Yeah. I had a patient tell me that I gave her four hours of her day back. I was like, what do you mean? And she said, I just, I'm not constantly thinking about what I'm going to eat next. Yeah. Like, okay. how freeing is that? That's amazing. So yes, it really works on the level of the brain and it just quiets our, our desire our, for food. You know, it probably takes us back to more how our brain was before we were introduced to all of the junk food out there, these hyper palatable things that have changed our brain and made it very hard to regulate a normal relationship with, with hunger and food. And it's what my patients tell me is the, the best gift. So how does it exactly, what's happening in those GLP-1 receptors in the brain that's changing that? We're still learning about this, but what we do know is it influences the release of dopamine in a, a particular part of the brain called the uh, nucleus accumbens, and it decreases reward. So food and alcohol and drugs and other addictive behaviors all probably work on the same level of the brain. And so we find that when you have a decreased desire for food, especially when it was like food that was all controlling, we'll see the same thing for decreased desire for alcohol, if alcohol was all consuming for you, or cigarettes, or even drugs. Lots of reports. Maybe pornography. Or pornography. I mean, I have not actually seen that studied yet, but I'm sure it's it's out well, there. I would say, you know, probably one is that pornography addiction is not a, is not recognized in mm. terms of a thing. There's problematic porn use. And based on the 
you know, most up-to-date literature, they say like 4% of the population has it, but it's very difficult to study because there's no clear definition. And then, you know, who, it, like, because someone could watch porn for one time a year and feel like they have a, an addiction because that's yeah. too much for them. Yeah. There's a lot of, like, thought behind what is bad and what is good in terms of, like, there's no, like, oh, I use it every day, so it's bad. And I use it once a week and it's bad. Like, it's really about how you perceive yeah, it. Yeah, but I feel like that you could easily study, same, same can be said for shopping addiction, which is actually something I've heard a lot about this. Like, I don't feel the desire to just like go buy things to, to give myself a dopamine hit. Yeah. I bet it could be pretty easy to subjectively study this and just ask people if they feel like there's if they improvement. they feel like they have a problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or just, has there been improvement? Like, is this something you think about less? Yeah. If you, if you identified that it was too much. Sometimes we do things that we don't even think are problems, but then you notice after on this drug, people will say like, I think I was like, spending a lot of time, you know, scrolling on Instagram and it's not giving me the same amount of pleasure or, you know, I was really truthfully drinking too much at night. It wasn't alcoholism and I could stop and it wasn't binge drinking, but it just wasn't something that I needed. And now I realize how much I don't need it. So it's this dysregulated dopamine response and it's tempered with these drugs. And, you know, that can have a trickle down effect in other parts of your life. But generally, we're just seeing positive, positive, positive across the board with its influence on the brain. Just so we're not um, only being unbiased or unbalanced here, what are some side effects of these drugs? Like what ty- types of what people can't take them? And then yeah. what kinds of side effects are people seeing? Okay, so uh, maybe just even back up, you know, we really only have FDA approval for a handful of things. We're talking about these positive effects and on what we're seeing on the brain, but really it's for type two diabetes management, obesity management, and now it's garnering some other indications kind of in the cardiovascular space and, and more to come. Who can't take them? Very few people actually can't take them. Now access and cost is a different issue, but we really avoid these drugs in people with a family history of something called MEN type two cancers, endocrine cancers, and medullary thyroid cancers. This risk is actually theoretical more than something we see in actuality, but we wanna be extra careful that we're not inciting tumor growth in this very specific population. Other than that, you it's not approved, or it's not really studied, so hence not approved, Approved for use in breastfeeding or pregnancy. Okay. Yeah, that's pretty typical. For yeah, most exactly. Drugs. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So you can't do much. Exactly. Um, so generally, a lot of people can take it. I think the other big thing is like, should the everyday person take it for just like a couple pounds of weight loss? Well, I can I can very clearly answer that. Just for a couple pounds of weight loss, no. But or or ten or fifteen, <sighs> like. They're not over, they're not maybe very overweight or they're slightly overweight or they're at the high level of normal and they just want to lose like 10 or 15 pounds. Let me give you the textbook answer and then I'll tell you where I think this whole conversation is going. So the FDA says that for weight management, you very clearly need to have a BMI of 27 or greater with a comorbidity, so some health issue related to excess weight. And honestly, in the majority of people that come to me with excess weight, I can find something. Or just straight up, you've got you're totally healthy, we can't find a single thing wrong with you, and you're just overweight, then a BMI greater than 30. BMI is not a very great tool really yeah. to tell us about metabolic health. And so body fat is actually a better indi- indicator of health and need to potentially lose weight. I also think that we are seeing such tremendous benefit that maybe in 10 years, we will start bending the rules on this. And when cost comes down and longer term studies for just prevention are there instead of treatment, we might be using these medications in a different way. And some people might say, you know, actually, I know my family history and I know what five or 10 pounds is going to lead to and all of the the risks of taking these meds are less than the benefits for me and so we'll consider it. But really right now, no, we're saying, hey, these meds are, and or, you know, kind of going back to the idea of like how it's influencing our brain, we might say, this is going to get approval for alcohol use disorder and this is going to get approval for drug disorder and for other addictive behaviors. I think we're a little far away from it, but we see the benefits there. And so especially in patients who have kind of these these comorbidities of both weight and another issue we're treating, they're like a really good solution. I think this conversation will evolve. I think what we have to be careful about is that we shouldn't be putting everybody in the population on this medication, right? And we mm-hmm. do still need to be working very hard. And I would like everyone to hear this, that I do think these drugs are revolutionary, but we need to fix the problem of what 
has led to this widespread obesity epidemic over the last 40 years. We need to fix that. Yeah. Two things can happen at the same time. You know, I do not think we just have to throw these to the side and say, we'll fix the food system and we'll fix our ecosystem of what got us here. I don't also think we should just put everyone on this medication, yeah. right? We have we have to allow the world to kind of like recalibrate here. And we can do that through improving our food sources and really educating and changing some of our recommendations because we've been a little upside down in some of our guidance. For like years, decades. Yeah. Um, Yeah. yeah. I think the other thing about this is, um, you know, there are certainly some concerns and I think some of them are founded and some of them are are need a little work. I've heard of like the Ozempic face, the Ozempic butt, (laughs) and also the, the fear of weight of muscle loss. Yeah. So let's talk about that. So whenever you lose weight, you lose muscle in addition to fat. And our goal always is to lose more fat than you do muscle. And one of the ways, well, there are a few things you can do to help that is to keep up your protein. That's really hard to do for a lot of patients. You really need to prioritize protein. Mm -hmm. Number one thing that my patients do. Number two, probably it turns into number one is strength training. Mm-hmm. So we have to focus on building a muscle. I know you know this. I see you at the gym. I love it. <laughs> yeah, uh, It's so important. And it's not something, it, that's one of the things that I think we need to change in our whole education system. We were we grew up as children of like cardio, cardio, cardio. Mm-hmm. How about let's teach everyone how to lift some weights, you right. know, and like really make that part of our physical education. So we have to do things that hold on to our muscle. I see a lot of, headlines that say that these drugs lead to muscle wasting. That's not true. Actually, there's an improved ratio of uh, fat to muscle loss on these medications versus a calorie restricted diet. And actually, there are drugs in the pipeline that are in this class of drugs, but that will be muscle sparing. Hmm. That's going to be amazing. Exactly. So that will really be the thing. We're like, well, geez, if we can, if we can further kind of help this ratio and just Muscle is more metabolically active than fat, and it mm-hmm. keeps you. It's the longevity organ, right? Right. And so, if we can keep that stronger through our weight loss, we will be in a better position. And potentially, I mean, in, in theory, if we had a lot more muscle, then those are the patients that are able to maintain their weight loss and potentially come off or down or titrate down on these medications. Or in the example of like significant weight loss where there's regain, if you build like so much muscle, it's going to be a lot easier to sit in that maintenance mode because you have a totally different body than you did before. Right. Not just physically, but just like how it's operating. The ozempic face and the ozempic butt, that just has to do with rapid weight loss. And it's worse with age because our collagen doesn't rebound as much, and we all know this. And the thing I'll say also about fat and muscle loss, we have to be very careful in patients over the age of 65. I'm always telling my patients, no, skinny is not what we're going for here. It's health, but really in that population, because they are at a higher risk for developing sarcopenia, mm-hmm. which is, hey, you got thin, but you lost all your muscle. Right, right. So we don't want that either. I was just talking to my, I had a 70 year old couple this morning and I was just talking to them about how, like, I was like, what do you eat? And I was like, you guys are not getting enough protein, like by far. And in that age group, it's even more important to get all your protein because you, your muscles are a bit more resistant at that point. Yeah. 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 And to go to like, I have, my grandfather's 94 years old, still does his exercises, (laughs) you know, like it might not look like the exercises you did when you were in your forties. But you've got to you've got to lift some weights. You've got to do something that has resistance and keeps you active. So tell me the other thing about people worry about is that they're now not going to be able to enjoy food like they used to. And mm. there's such a emotional component to food, yeah. right? And going out with friends and having a meal and sharing something that's like amazing or delicious or whatever. Yeah. So what are you seeing in your patients and what's the data? There's not great data on what we see in this, but every doctor who's using this medication will tell you that this is a complaint and it only pops up in certain populations. So let, let me explain. So most people are able to enjoy the food that they loved, but in a different way, right? You just can't eat through your hunger. You can't eat as much. And potentially you might actually lose interest in the things that you used to love. 
but maybe that food doesn't serve you anymore. So maybe like the fried food, it's like kind of turns your stomach or some people lose a taste for coffee. And that's actually a common, it's not really a complaint. It's just uh, an awareness. Like I just don't crave my coffee as much or alcohol, like the taste of certain things change. And we actually know that the taste buds of GLP-1 users change on a genetic level very quickly. And so they crave, we do know that they crave crave less salty, less sweet, um, less calorically dense, less ultra processed foods, which we're seeing reflected in shopping behaviors at the grocery store, right? I mean, like the big food giants are kind of freaking out because people aren't buying as much of the snack foods and, you know, hyper palatable foods as they were. So things change. I think the complaint of I can't enjoy food in the same way is a little different. So in that case, I think people find the ones that feel it were using food as an emotional crutch. And it was more, it was less about the taste of the food and more about how it made them feel. Mm Mm-hmm to eat this thing or eat this much of this thing. And that can feel sad. And I call it in my practice anhedonia, like a, like a, a, lesson, a dampening of pleasure, kind of like a lack yeah. of pleasure. I find, and it's not depression than when I identify it, it's, but it's like a longing. It's almost like, okay, I'm going to mourn that and I have to figure out what else to do to make myself feel alive in that way again. Mm. So I actually give this as homework to my patients. I'm like, what What did you do as a kid? Like, what did you like to do to unwind? As adults, we unwind a lot with food and alcohol. Yeah. And when you take the ability to enjoy those things in excess away, there can be a temporary mourning period. And so you have to fill it. And a lot of people will be like, okay, I'm a person who works out now. You know, Mm -hmm. and I have people who turn to like hobbies, like I'm going to put together a Lego set with my kid. You know, I'm going to I'm going to paint again. I'm going to garden. I'm going to have space to do the things that were crowded out by behaviors that probably in retrospect weren't serving me. But in the short term, as I'm figuring this out, it can feel a little like a loss. So I can imagine that this would also change your friend group and potentially your relationship. I mean, does it ever? Yes. So I see changes in both the platonic and romantic relationship level. So yeah, if your friends all just go out and drink and eat in excess, and all of a sudden you don't actually want to do that, that can be very confusing and it can be sad and it can be lonely. So I actually do this on my intake. I kind of ask people like, what are you doing on the weekends? Like, what are you doing to like unwind to your friends? How does your spouse eat? You know, what does your boyfriend like to do? And if it's all about food and alcohol, I'll set them up like right away. Like, okay, we've got to, we've got to troubleshoot this. And can you have a conversation ahead of time with this person that like, maybe let's go bowling. Like, let's go do something else. Different. Like yeah. have a game night instead, you know? Let's go to the gym together. Yeah, exactly. So I think people need to be aware that these relationships can change. And, um, You know, romantically, I always do an intake about like, you know, what's your relationship like? Are you going to share that you're doing this? You know, you're starting on a new journey, on a health journey. Are they in support? Because you, you, it's going to shift. It's going to change. If you guys enjoyed that clip with Dr. Alexandra Soa, make sure to check out the full-length episode on the Rena Malik MD podcast.